My mom and my brother and I lived in Boston. She got married to someone that lived up here in New Hampshire, and so she ended up moving up here. I ended up staying down in Boston with my, at the time, husband and my three children. I ended up going through a divorce. I decided that it was better for me to move up here and be with family. I knew the Lord, but um, their father was not a believer. So when we separated, when we went our separate ways, it was my opportunity to really just show them the love of God and introduce them to the Lord a little bit deeper. Less than a year ago, I lost my youngest son. He was two years old. It was something that was very unexpected. It was hard for all of us, especially the children. Through that, God has shown me his resurrecting power and how good he is and how, if we're willing to surrender our pain and our struggles to him, that he's willing to make something beautiful out of it. Having to walk this painful experience out with my children has helped me to be able to really magnify the love of God and to really talk to them about where their brother is, that the brother's not, is not dead, he's alive in Christ. And because of that, I walk around differently now. I walk around kingdom-minded. He's always on my mind, he's always in my heart. It gives us that constant reminder that, that we are living for something bigger than ourselves, that we are living to allow God to use us to bring forth his kingdom on earth, and that one day we will, we will be there and we'll be completely reunited and we won't have to say goodbye again. My son, he was someone that I admired. He was fearless, he was courageous, he would walk into a room and he didn't care who was in it, he would just be so full of love, he wasn't afraid to love. The two years that I watched him grow and he really taught me that that's who I wanted to be. The day that he passed away, that spirit of fear was broken off of me because I realized that I had to be courageous, I had to be fearless. I promised myself that I would not go back to that person that I used to be, that person full of fear, that I would live life to the fullest because we don't know, tomorrow's not promised. And when I see my son again, I want to be able to look at him and say that he made a difference in my life, that his life was not in vain. A lot of times we think that suffering is almost like a, like a punishment, but I have learned that suffering is an opportunity to feel and to experience the love of God in another dimension, in another way. If we will allow ourselves to trust God and to really surrender ourselves and to lay at His feet with all our pain and all our struggle that He has entrusted us with, that He is so anxious to make something beautiful out of it. He's so anxious to glorify Himself with your life. You know, it's uh, so special um, when somebody shares their story and when they, they speak from their experiences and, and share from the heart. And, and to share a story of grief and mourning over the loss of a child, that's pretty powerful. And to see the hope that can be available and that is available. And to hear not just a story, but really a, a testimony about who God is and who we are in relationship to him and what he is able to do. It doesn't diminish the pain that comes from that loss. But I think what it does is magnify the goodness of our God and allows other people to see that. There's a phrase that um, I've used a lot in my life. It was not one I invented. It was some, one that someone shared with me, and, and they encouraged me with this one time. They said, Bo, never waste a pain. Never waste a pain. You see, there's all kinds of pain, and I, I realized that in my life there were, there were lots of times where I was, I was wasting those pains. I wasn't um, using them as an opportunity to experience God's comfort, to experience the hope that he had, to, to experience restoration and renewal and revival. Instead, that, that pain may have just been pushed down inside of me. And there's a reason we push down the pain inside of us. It's because we don't like how people respond to it. You may have experienced this before. You, you've tried to share a pain. You've tried to share grief with someone, and you got this kind of response. Get over it. You ever had that one before? 
get over it. Now, maybe they didn't just, well, we are in New England, so maybe they did just look right at you and they get over it. I actually had a pastor one time. He said, I'm no good at counseling. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, when people are grieving and stuff, you know, my solution is I'm like, here's your problem. You just need to get over it. You know, we don't need to meet again. I was like, yeah, you probably shouldn't meet with people. That's uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely not your gift. Uh, but that, that kind of mindset that where people may don't, maybe not just look you in the eye and say, hey, you need to get over it, but you can tell by their body language, you know, where it's almost like they're looking at their watch going, how long have you been feeling this way? That, that we should probably wrap that up. It's probably time to just get over it. And that's not helpful. In fact, it, it's painful. It kind of amplifies the pain as opposed to bringing comfort. But we have a God who, who is a comforter. We have a God who does provide us hope. And so as we think about grief and loss and pain and the suffering that we, occur, uh, that we incur in this world, we have a God who's right there with us in the midst of it. And he's not telling us, hey, get over it. You've probably, I bet you've probably felt like you've heard that message in church before. Like, hey, just, just get over it. That's not what God is saying. He's saying, I'm, I, I'm here with you. Share it with me. Our memory verse for this series we're in um, called Hope is Here is found in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And we're gonna put that on the screens. We're gonna read it out loud online. I want you guys to participate. Read this out loud with us. Let's all do it together. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we heard that testimony video uh, to start um, on this message, I, that was one of the things that really stood out to me it was there was an overflowing of hope that was present in that. And it wasn't just you know, somebody uh, you know, putting uh, on airs to tell a story. That's, that's the reality of where she is. Now, there's, there's good days, there's bad days, there's tough days, there's hard days. There's, there's days uh, where, where God's you know, hope is, is more present and, and feels more real and more tangible. But that's just the human condition. But to be in a position where, you know, at the end of the day, all in all, there is a hope that just can't possibly be explained away, that, that can't possibly be contained, that comes from God's presence, that fills us to a measure of all fullness through the power of his Holy Spirit, that is a powerful, powerful witness and testimony to who God is. And God moves and works through that, and that's a way that we worship him. And worship's not just singing songs. And worship is exalting God, lifting him up and saying, ah, God, you are greater. And so in our hope and our grief, when we are, are looking to God and we're turning to him and we're testifying to how he provides hope and how he gives comfort and how he provides purpose, that is a way of worship and God is revealed through the worship of his people. And that is powerful worship right there. Psalm chapter 34, verse 18 it says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I, I love that Psalm. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And I, I know that some of you right now are absolutely devastated. You are brokenhearted and you are, are crushed in spirit and, and maybe you know, showing up uh, at a church building was the hardest thing that you could possibly do. Maybe even logging online and joining us online or on Facebook right now, you saw the topic was grief and you're like, I don't know that I can do this. Well, break out the Kleenex, let's get on with it. Because God is, is present and whether you're in this building or in your home or in your car or at work or in a coffee shop, God is close to the brokenhearted. And if you're brokenhearted and crushed in spirit, he is close and he saves and he comforts and he is good and he is for you, not against you. And he can handle whatever it is that, that you want to express to him and share with him because he is present and good and powerful and strong. And when we turn to him and rely on his power, he is able to work miracles in our hearts and do things that we could never do on our own. And so let's get down to the kind of the nitty gritty of grief a little bit. First, a, kind of a working definition for us. Grief is the pain that is felt after the loss of something deeply valued. So this is kind of our working definition. It's the pain that's felt when we lose something of, of great value. 
Now, this can be anything. So when we say, okay, the Lord is, is close to the brokenhearted and he saves uh, those who are, are crushed in spirit, then this can be regarding any kind of loss. So there's all kinds of losses. So let's look at some of these different losses because usually we think, first of all, um, of death. That's kind of the, the first one we think. So you talk about grief, almost everybody, our minds go immediately to death. So you could go, well, I'm not really dealing with that right now. Ah, come on, sure we are. We, we all, to, to one degree, it may be fresh, it, it may have had uh, you know, some time pass, it may be something that we've experienced some, some healing and some hope in there. But death is one of those things that the grieving of the loss of a loved one, it doesn't just go away. It's present and it's there. Sometimes we bury it deep down and we don't want to talk about it anymore and we don't want to acknowledge it. Um, and I'm telling you, that's not what God wants for you. That may be what other people want for you, the get over it crowd, that may be what they want because they don't want to deal with their own grief. That's usually what happens. There's not necessarily a mean-spirited thing. It's just usually, I know when I do that, what I've done is I've got some grief, some loss, and I've pushed it down, and I don't want it to come up in me. So I'm like, hey, could you just get over yours so I can ignore mine? That's usually what's going on there. And so the, the ob most obvious one is death, but that's not the only thing. There's other losses. There's the loss of a relationship. I mean, come on, you want, to be, you want to be crushed in spirit? A relationship where you invested your life and, and you, were, you were investing in that relationship, whether it be a marriage, uh, a family relationship, a business relationship, you were trusting, you were taking those risks, you were putting yourself out there, and then that relationship is broken, it's severed. That loss is big. And it leaves a hole, and it's to be grieved. That's why, like, divorce is, is no joke. I know a lot of times when, when there is a divorce and you, you separate two people like that, I, I've, had, I've heard people, you know, kind of be like, oh, it's going to be great. I'm like, no. No, it's going to be so much. It's going to be great. And, and I'm not, like, hammering that. It's just one of those things where you should probably be aware that it's going to be hard. There's going to be residual pain from that, and it's going to sneak up on you. You know, maybe a few months later, you know, after the newness of that new situation has worn off, and there's going to need to be some grieving over the loss that's happened there. So relationship loss. Another type of loss would be a job loss, which could also include the loss of, of income. There, that's, I know that may sound, some people will go, well, that's petty. Dude, I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to grief, there's really nothing petty. Like in, our, in our story, we, we were dealing with the loss of a child, and, and maybe, you know, you go, well, that, that's got to be the worst, you know, that, we'll put that one at the top, that's the hardest. And you know what, maybe it is, it seems unimaginable. But every loss and every grief is something that can crush us and leave us broken, brokenhearted, and we have the opportunity to turn to God and trust him. Um, there's a loss of uh, material possession can produce grief. Remember that we're different people and we all experience different things. That's why when somebody is like sharing their grief with you, just because it might not be something you would grieve over, you should probably recognize that they are. Not correct that behavior, but, but maybe enter into it with them and, and help them carry that. There's the loss of, um, next one. Oh, there it is, pet. See, I lost my pet. I have to, <laughs> it's over there. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I, w w when we've lost our, our pets before, um, our house was unbearable. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just let you know right now, if, if, if you lose a, a pet and you come and share that with me, don't tell anybody, but I'll give you a hug. <laughs> okay, because I'm with you. I, I, a pet, you know, a family, the part of the family, and, you know, maybe you're not a pet person, but I think I hope you can can be kind and generous and gracious and be like God and recognize that when somebody's grieving the loss of a pet, that's real. That's that's a real loss. Um, there's a, the loss of time. I think maybe you were investing a lot of time in something that has then failed, and you can grieve the loss of that time. There's loss of respect. You made a mistake, and. You, you know, people don't respect you anymore. Or maybe you didn't even make the mistake. It's just there's that loss of respect because of what people think. And that can be grieved over. There's the loss of innocence that happens. All of these losses are real. And there's many, many others. 
And so I, I would just propose to you that probably all of us are in some stage of grief or another because we all experience loss. That's a part of life. And so grief is that pain that is felt. So what does God want to do with that? As we're all grieving to, to one degree or another, and we all grieve a little bit differently, we express it a little bit differently. Um, I, I just want you to think, what are you grieving over right now? What is your most recent loss? Or maybe it's a loss that was uh, a long time ago that has been pushed down or maybe resurfacing right now. Let's go ahead and, and bring that to the forefront of our minds, and let's, let's go ahead and, and take it to God. And let's see what God has to say. Let's see what he's going to do. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And so there's a, there's a reminder here that we are suffering grief, this loss, in all kinds of trials that we're experiencing, the things that we face and the loss of things. There is a grief that is there. But we are able to say, okay, praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he's given us a new birth. There's the promise of new life. We have this promise that's not just kind of this out there, outlandish promise that's far away, but it is present and it is real, the power of the resurrection. That Jesus conquered the grave, that he was risen again, and the hope that we have in him. In fact, what it says is we have a living hope. In other words, uh, it's a living hope. So a living hope is a growing hope. This is pretty rad. Living things grow. And so if we have a living hope, then what we have is a growing hope, a, a hope that as we experience God, as we turn to him, as we trust in him, our hope actually grows. Because oftentimes what happens is in, in grief and in that loss, sometimes our, we feel like our hope is shattered and destroyed. But what if we really enter in and we step into this living hope with him? This will blow people's minds. It'll blow your mind. It blows my mind. I've, I've actually seen it. As, as, and I've experienced it, as we're grieving, hope grows, it doesn't diminish us when we grieve with God. And we share this with him and we, we put our trust in him. He is able and he is close to us, not far away. And so when it comes to grief, and this is so hugely important, grief needs to be expressed, not suppressed. So important. I, I really want you, would you read this out loud with me? Online, do it too. Everybody right now. Grief needs to be expressed, not suppressed. So while we live in a get over it world, hey, could you stop talking about that? Hey, we're really tired of, of walking with you through this. Hey, could you keep that to yourself? That's not God. That's not his church. Grief needs to be expressed. And I'll tell you why. This passage, is, it blew my mind as I was preparing for this message over the last couple of months. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. It's the Sermon on the Mount, what's called the Beatitudes. What Jesus says is, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be what? Comforted. Comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That, that, that one sentence just kept running over and over and over in my mind. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, happy. That word blessed means happy. Happy are you when you mourn. Why? Because then you'll be comforted. Well, mourning is the expression of grief. So if we desire comfort, if we need comfort, which we all do because we're all grieving, we're all experiencing loss. The only way to find that comfort and receive that from him is to express our grief, to share that, to go ahead and allow that grief to be expressed because when we mourn, we are comforted. When we suppress that grief, then actually what it does is it, it pushes us away from God. That's why that psalm says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. He comes to, I mean, we're closer to him when we do that. But when we suppress that and we play pretend, which I know that's kind of the churchy world. Hey, put on your happy church face. Put on your happy church clothes. Everybody play pretend. How you doing? Oh, we're doing great. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What in the world? God, if that was true, I mean, I don't understand the world we live in because most of you aren't in that place. Hey, how's it going? Ah! <laughs> well, God can handle it. 
His church can handle it. And we ought to be handling it together. We ought to be expressing that together and sharing that. Because when it's suppressed, there's no comfort. But when we express that, and I know it's scary, and I know it's hard, and I know you've had bad experiences, and and so I will tell you there's strength and bravery and courage that the Lord can provide. But when we express that, then there is comfort that can come and will come. God will provide it. Now, there's lots of ways to express grief. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Grief is different, so remember that. Just because somebody's not grieving the way you grieve. You've probably experienced this before, like at a funeral or something, and, and somebody's, you know, grieving in a different way than you are, in a different stage of grief, or expressing that in a different way, and you're like, well, they're horrible. No, they're just expressing it differently. They're feeling it differently. So there's different ways of, of expressing grief. One obvious way is to cry. Um, that's important. It's that, that buildup and that release. And, and so to be able to do that and to be free to do that, to talk. Sometimes people just, they need to be able to talk and, and share and tell stories and, and ex- get it out. Uh, other people, they just, they really want to remember you know, things like, like anniversaries and uh, maybe special objects that remind them. And, and to not feel ashamed when that grief is fresh and renewed, when there is that reminder. But to, to go ahead and say, yeah. Because that loss was, well, it matters. And it's, I'm not over it. And I'm not going to get over it. And God's not telling me to get over it. So I'm going to remember. Sometimes we grieve by by having a, a memorial service or a funeral. Um, I know this sounds weird, but like, like the pet thing. You could do that for your pet. I, I mean, I'm not going to officiate it, but you could. <laughs> I'll empower you. You should do it. You know? um, but you can. Or any kind of, of a loss. Um, sometimes you, you want to make something and... You know, even, even an anniversary, you know, on those, when that loss occurred, to go ahead and memorialize that. that. That's a way of expressing grief. And so it needs to be expressed. That's how we can then receive comfort. And so here's the deal. You're going to grieve. It's going to happen. Hopefully you'll express it. But you can grieve with God or without God. So we can grieve with him. In other words, we can turn to him. We can go to him instead of running away from him. But if you're going to do that, you're going to need to get real with God. And you get honest with him. You're going to be sincere with him. You're going to tell the truth. And the truth is that God um, is not like people. Where people are saying, get over it. God's not saying that. God actually wants to grieve with you. And I know this is unimaginable. He cares more about the lost than even we do. I I want you to chew on that. We don't have a God who says... That's not important. That's not a big deal. What's wrong with you? Why are you upset about that? Hey, don't you trust me? You should just get over it. We got a God that goes, oh, I get it. And I, I've got it. And I'm with you. And I'm close to you when you're brokenhearted. And I save when you're crushed in spirit. He cares even more than, than we care. That's a powerful thing. If you're looking for a comforter, that's a powerful, powerful thing to be comforted. You, you know what it's like when you're experiencing a loss and a grief and there's somebody that you're sharing that with who is right in there with you? I mean, they're right in there with you. They're not just, you know, being strong with a shoulder to cry on, but they're, they're weeping with you. That is a comfort and that is our God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all, what? Comfort. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. The promise of Scripture right here is that there is comfort to be had, and not a little bit, but all of it. 
Not even just a lot, not even just like, hey, it'll probably be enough. Not only like, it'll probably cover your grieving and, and your mourning, but it, it's all of it. He's the God of all comfort. So whatever we're grieving, whatever that is, whatever the loss may be, whatever anybody may have told you before, God is with you in there, and he is the God of all comfort, the Father of compassion, and he comforts us in all our troubles. I I want you to understand, he comforts us in all our troubles. Some of those troubles we produced ourselves. So maybe some of you went there. Well, Well, yeah, well, I did this. Okay. I'm glad you understand that and you recognize that. How's God gonna comfort you in that? It's not like he's going, well, good, you deserve it. He is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so you get in that place where you're like, well, I'm responsible for this and I did this. He's like, all right. I'm the God of all comfort. I will comfort you in all your troubles. And the cool thing about that is when you receive his comfort, now you're able to comfort others with the comfort you've received from God. It's like as we pray for one, God, please give me one person to share your love with, which by the way, I don't wanna just say, let's actually, can we pray it together? God, please give me one person to share your love with. Let's say that together. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, one of those ways that we do that is by sharing his comfort. So it's, it's his love. His love is unending, it's unfailing. It doesn't run out, it, knows, it doesn't stop. The same with his comfort. We're praying for one, that we're gonna comfort people like God comforts them, but not just because we're like working really hard at it, we're gonna be really committed to it, but because we ourselves are comforted. We express our grief. We grieve with God, not without him. We, we don't suppress it, but we come to him and he draws near to us and he saves us and he comforts us. And then we are free and able and called and overjoyed to go and comfort others. Like you can't imagine not. It's a privilege and an, and an honor to walk with somebody in their grief. All that nonsense of get over it starts to really go away. There's five stages of grief that are commonly referred to, and I don't know if they're actually in order, um, but I'm gonna share them. And I, I want you to think about this, and then we're gonna look at them in a slightly different way. So five stages of, of grief. The first would be denial, like this isn't happening, this isn't real, this couldn't possibly be the case that you know this can happen to me or in this situation um the second would be anger this is the who can i punch in the face stage like you know next person who tells me to get over it next person who gives me a grieving book is going to get punched in the face um <laughs> there's a time and a place uh the next one would be bargaining like how, how can i fix this you know what what can happen you know what, let's make a deal kind of a thing uh then we have the de- depression where it's just such a heavy weight why go on, what's the point, life kind of stops, you, you have a tendency, it manifests in all kinds of ways, but you can really you know, let your physical self go, um, you can stop trying, you really just, you're, you're, dis, you're disconnecting from life. And then um, there's acceptance, okay, this did happen, this is a, a part of who I am, this is a part of my journey, and so am I willing to go on and live? So here they are, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. What I wanna encourage you with, go back, Put them back, thank you. What I wanna, well, all right, there we go. There we go. So what, what I wanna encourage you with as you look at these five things is to re- recognize that when there's grief, that we can actually express all five of these to God. And it's really important. So denial, like God, are you, are you kidding me? Like what, what's happening here? There, there's, there's no way you, you, where are you in this? How, how could you, you couldn't allow this to happen. You couldn't possibly be in this, God. If you love me, you wouldn't allow this. The, the anger that comes from that, like, are you, God, you know, I just, I mean, I'm gonna tell you right now, if you have never been angry with God, you don't know the guy. You don't know him. So I love you. But he's maddening. He's just so perfect. And he's patient. And he's steady. And he's always there. And you want to be like, get out of my space. You didn't do things the way I thought you would. I thought we had a good thing going here. I don't do it. There's a lot of people who are just... uh, 
they're afraid of that. But I'm gonna, you want a relationship. A relationship requires honesty. Talk about a relationship with God. And we got people who aren't honest with him, who aren't able to say, God, I'm ticked. I mean, he already knows anyway. Makes me mad, all knowing. Can't even lie to the guy. <laughs> and, and in our anger, it doesn't push him away. But when we're honest about that, you don't have to stay in that place, but you, you can express that to him and you can get those, those, those words out, those thoughts, those feelings out. And this God of comfort, of all comfort, will comfort you with his comfort. He's, he's got you. So express that to God. It, and the Psalms are full of, of, of anger and then kind of this progression of how God moves through that. Bargaining. Like, like God, what, what do you want me to do? I mean, how, how is this going to work? How do we go on? Uh, the depression, sharing that, that with God. Like, like God, I don't, I don't think I can ever be used by you again. I don't, I don't really know what to do. I, 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 I feel stuck. I, I feel this heavy weight. It's too much for me. Acceptance. God, you're, all right, you're still the same because you don't change. So is it possible that this particular pain could not be wasted but could be used to exalt you in worship and for you to be revealed? Because when we think about grief and the expression of this, I think it's very true that it's easy to become over, overwhelmed or overcome with grief. And you can be overcome with grief or overcome grief. Now, if you're doing it on your own, I would just say let's prepare to, to be overcome with grief. But if we're doing it with God, then... I believe that he has power and authority over our grief that we can overcome with him. But it's really cool the way he does it. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So he has this divine power that gives us everything we need through his precious promises. His, his promises like when it comes to grief that, that he is close to the brokenhearted, that he saves those who are crushed in spirit, that he is with us in our grief. We depend and rely on him so that we overflow with hope, that it's a living hope, a hope that is growing, that is not diminishing, but even in the midst of grief and in loss and our mourning, expressing that grief, that the hope is growing so that we get to participate in his divine nature. That's the overcoming. To overcome grief, we're, we're doing it by participating in God's divine nature, by his work and what he's doing. So when you think about overcoming grief, just a, a couple of quick thoughts would be, first of all, rely on God's power. I'm not going to rely on my own. It's not a pull myself up by my bootstraps, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle this grief, I got it under control. Ah, I'm going to let God have it under control. Next, uh, focus on what you know. What are his great and precious promises? What has God declared? Okay, he is the resurrection and the life. The here and now, what we're experiencing, these are what the Bible refers to as light and momentary troubles. They're very real in the present. They're not to be diminished in that regard, but they are momentary. There is eternity for us. We are created uh, to live eternally with God. And so let's focus on what we know, what his promises are. Believe those promises. So we fix our mind on them, and then, then we make a choice. Believing is a choice. There's faith involved in this, and it doesn't have to necessarily have to be a leap of faith. It could be a step of faith, but by focusing on that, you get to the edge, and then you get to decide, will I step into it, or will I run away from it? And so believe in God's promises, and then live. Participate in the divine nature. Live. And, and don't just survive. Live abundantly. That's what Jesus did. He said, I came to give you life and you may have it abundantly. Like live with passion and, and power and purpose. But please hear this. 
Don't think for one minute that means, oh, I got over it. Because I don't think we do. And I don't think we should. Because just the thought of that, I, I think for those who are, or maybe self-aware and, and in tune with what's going on, you might, you might have some real discomfort because you're like going, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get over it. And there's lots of reasons for that. Part of it, it's like part of your identity. This loss, this experience, it's part of who you are. You have maybe a fear of, of forgetting, of losing that all over again. Can you imagine that? Hey, get over it. Well, I'm grieving a loss, so now I'm just gonna lose it for good. That's rough. And then guilt. How could I? How dare I be happy? We think that we're honoring that loss by being unhappy and not living. But really what we have the opportunity to do is live with God. And so here's the challenge I think God has for us. He's not saying get over it. He's saying get on with it. Don't get over your grief, but get on with it. Live. Express your grief. Mourn. And get on with it with God. And let him do his thing. Because, you see, what happens with grief is if we don't express that, if we don't mourn, if we don't let God do his thing and comfort us, there's an arrested development. Our growth in him stops. And we stop producing fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're not sharing his love with anybody. There's not more people coming into the kingdom of heaven. We're not living abundantly in him. Because we just stopped. But right now is, is a moment where, not that you get over it, but you can get on with it. And there are gonna be happy moments and Joyful moments and victorious moments and moments where you're, you're able to share the story with power and conviction and, and hope. And then there's moments where you'll be a wreck. And we get on with it. And we get on with it together. You see, when you do that, when, when you trust God like that, then you're also in a position to comfort like your father comforts. Because you are comforted. I'm going to tell you right now, when you yourself are not comforted, when that grief is just suppressed, it's impossible to comfort anybody else. And God's got his church. I mean, we live in a hurting, hurting world full of loss. And here is an army of people who can experience his comfort and then share that comfort in our workplaces, our homes, our schools, our communities. And there can be healing in this world. And so as we share in a time of communion together, the God of comfort is here. And he is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so as we have communion, then here's a chance to not only receive from God or a reminder of his death, burial, and resurrection and the hope that we have and the salvation that we have and that he has come for us. I encourage you all to, to say yes to what Jesus has done and take the bread, take the juice, hold on to that until we've all been served. But, but let's go before him right now and let's let the God of comfort comfort us, express your grief to him in mourning. Put a name to it, get real with him. If you need to get angry, get angry. But let's let God do his work and comfort us so we can comfort others. And let's get on with it together. I'd like to pray for you. Father, I thank you for your very great and precious promises. How they are true. They are real. I thank you that you're present with everybody, whether in this building or online, that, that God, you're with us and you're here. God, I pray that you would comfort as we mourn and that we would be comforted so we can comfort others. 
And we ask for that in Jesus' name.